Hey there, how is it going? I'm Ralph and today I would like to talk about non-functional requirements in the context of Scrum. In my trainings, this question gets asked over and over again and I just thought I'd make a quick webcast about that and describe how I personally go about that. A little bit about myself, so I'm Ralph Jokam. I started as a programmer in 97 and I learned quickly early on that you know all those technical things, at least when I was studying, was learning is great on the technical side. It doesn't help you to make the right product. So this is when I came in contact with the unified process and the URL. I like the use case centered approach to somehow put the, the user in the center. However, I turned to Agile in 2000 through extreme programming and I added Scrum in 2003 to my mixture. I really like Scrum because extreme programming is about the engineering practices, about how you write code. It's really specific. Whereas Scrum is this really powerful empirical management framework and this helps you to kind of also connect with management which is in every company and you need to work with them in a certain way. Uh, originally I'm from Germany. I spent then two years uh, at Oracle in the UK, um, one year in New York on the East Coast and then at a couple of companies uh, for eight years in Silicon Valley. For the last two and a half years, I was working there for, with ThoughtWorks, one of the leading agile uh, consulting companies. And kind of the companies you see there, this is either companies I was an employee or I was there on long engagements. So as you can see, I did come around from different cultures and domains. And the good news is that regardless of where you start, depending on culture or domain, it doesn't really matter. The end point is very, very comparable if you start to set up a self-organizing agile working environment. I founded Effective Agile, a Agile consulting company, uh, two years ago. And this is basically how I go out and uh, teach uh, Agile, give classes there, and, and also go into clients and work with them on site, and also with management, which is really important. Uh, just to change a couple of engineering practices is a good thing, but at the end, you really not try to make it systemic, so you really change the whole enterprise around that. Uh, since three years, I'm also a trainer with Scrum.org, the company of Ken Schwaber. And actually, this is Ken Schwaber and I, and I'm there teaching all the classes, Scrum Master, Product Owner, uh, Scrum Foundations, and Scrum Developer for the Java platform. I actually, I'm Europe's first Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. That's enough about me. This is a quick look at my website, how the website of my company looks like. Uh, if you have any interest, about Agile, needing training, coaching, something like that, I would be happy to help you out. So just go ahead and contact me. Enough about me and myself. Let's move on to the non-functional requirements. So let's say this is our product backlog. Where we have certain elements in there. We have a defect, certain requirements, constraints. Constraints are things which you need to do. They don't necessarily add value to the end user, but still stuff you need to do in order to maybe implement a requirement. And usually I like to put defects topmost because I don't want to have defects. I don't want to have things which are not working in my product. They need to be fixed immediately. So they always go topmost and they get handled. The other thing which is important that the product backlog is the single source of work for the development team because the product backlog is estimated. So we know about, we make estimates about how much certain things to develop will take. So if we only take work out of the product backlog, we can at the end of the sprint say exactly this is how much we were able to do. And this gives you a very precise velocity, which is nice if you want to have an accurate release plan. It's not actually nice, it is very important to have a proper velocity. And now assume that you take elements out of the product backlog and lots of other works from the other side. Things like that which you haven't estimated and they really slow you down and then you can't really tell how much we can do this sprint because you, you lose that transparency. Let's take now one of the requirements in the form of a user story, which is a common practice. And since I'm in Switzerland right now, I'm uh, using a banking example. And the user story is about wiring money of a private asset. So the user story reads like that. As a senior banking expert, I want to wire private banking assets to offshore accounts of premium customers so that the assets are no longer taxable. 
On the flip side of that card, we would have the acceptance criteria. So the acceptance criteria have to be fulfilled point by point so that the product owner can accept the user story. That's not a guarantee, but it's a precursor for acceptance of the product owner. And let's say we have identified four so far. It needs to follow the regulation X, Y, and C. The IBAN account is not stored, so we don't want to have any track record. Avoid US servers for routing. So, you know, the US and Switzerland are not really kind of best friends in the banking sector right now, so we really want to make sure. So, therefore, we just don't want to use any US servers for, for the routing of, of the money. And after everything has happened, the premium customer will receive an SMS stating that everything went through. So, now let's look at the non functional requirements. And let's say these are a bunch of the non-functional requirements we have identified. So the application needs to be scalable, reliable, secure. It has to use an Oracle database. So other databases apart from Oracle are not an option. And it has to be performant as well. So the way I see it is that non-functional requirements, some of them can be distinct. And with distinct, I mean that, you know, they are clearly kind of have a clear boundary. You can take them, do them, and say, I'm done with it. And, for example, this could be the Oracle database. That's very distinct. We, we, we basically get an Oracle database, we install it on the server, we make sure everything is working with it flawlessly, and then we can say, yes, it's there. We have done it. And then we have something, and this is the important thing about the non-functional requirements, which, is, which I call omnipresent. That means it could be anywhere, it could be nowhere, it's just you really need to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether certain non-functional requirements are applicable for a product backlog item. Right? So these are the other ones here. And then all the important, there are sometimes, which I call like a hybrid. So it's an omnipresent non-functional requirement and it also has a distinct part. Let's say for reliable. And in this case, we want to make sure the application, so the, the, the server where all of this is running on, has to be reliable. So therefore, we decide that we use a certain kind of hardware, which has a really strong record for being reliable. A certain kind of software, maybe a clustered software package, where once something, one server goes down, the other one picks up the load with load balancing and all of those things. So then we can take those and we can put those in the product backlog. So for the reliable, we can say we want to use an, a stable application server. So we don't want to use a free open source one. We want to use a high brand with load balancing, clustering, and all of those things. And now, with that in place, I go ahead and I number the non-functional requirements alphabetically through. So in our case, we would now have A, B, C, and D. And then we can say from those omnipresent non-functional requirements, now let's look at this specific user story. And then we can say, well, currently we understand that this user story has to cover the non-functional requirement C and D. So it has to be secure and perform. But now we realize Hmm, this thing also needs to address the non-functional requirement B because this thing has to be reliable because we don't store the IBAN information. So if something goes wrong, we cannot recreate where the money went and all of those things. So if this falls through, we would have a huge problem. So this thing really has to be, re really has to be reliable. However, now when we talk about that story in a, in a grooming session or in a sprint plan, it could mean that the developer sometimes say, hey, but listen, if we do that reliable, you need to make this and this sure and have to be aware about that. This would mean there's much, much more effort to do the user story. So in this case, it could actually mean that the estimate would go up. Let's say in this case, it goes up from five story points up to eight. So, and as I had said that the non-functional requirements, they are omnipresent, we can never really check them off. The only point when you can do that is once you have done your whole application and you have released it and you say, well, for the next couple of months, we're not going to touch it. Then you can go ahead and check them off. Then we know we covered them in the product we have, we have done. However, 
The moment you go back and you create a new product backlog and you start working on a product again, they become alive. And then you need to look at them and see, is this non-function requirement still applicable? Maybe you can take one off. Or maybe in this case, we add another one, a non-function requirement E compliance, because of you know all the banking things going on there, new laws, new regulations being put in place, so we have to fulfill some more compliance non-functional requirements as well. So with that, this is how I handle non-functional requirement and how I teach it to people or enterprises when I go in and, and help them to transition to Agile. And I hope that this gives you an idea about the, the nature of non-functional requirements and how they fit really nicely uh, within the context of Scrum. And if you have any questions, so please just drop me an email or find my uh, contact details on the internet at effectiveagile.com and I would be happy to help you. Bye.